This is a LibriVox recording, and all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, more LibriVox recordings, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording read for you by Perry Clayton. Cats by Robert Lind The champion cat show has been hailed at the Crystal Palace, but the champion cat was not there. One could not possibly allow him to appear in public. He is for show, but not in a cage. He does not compete because he is above competition. You know this as well as I. Probably you possess him. I certainly do. This is the supreme test of a cat's excellence, the test of possession. One does not say, you should see Brailsford's cat, or you should see Attic's cat, or you should see Sharp's cat, but you should see our cat. There is nothing we are more egoistic about, not even children, than about cats. I have heard a man, for lack of anything better to boast about, boasting that his cat eats cheese. In anyone else's cat it would have seemed an inferior habit, and only worth mentioning to the servant as a warning. But because the cat happens to be his cat, this man talks about its vice excitedly among women as though it were an accomplishment. It is seldom that we hear a cat publicly reproached with guilt by anyone above a cook. He is not permitted to steal from our own larder, but if he visits the next-door house by stealth and returns over the wall with a dover sole in his jaws, we really cannot help laughing. We are a little nervous at first, and our mirth is tinged with pity at the thought of the probably elderly and dyspeptic gentleman who had his luncheon filched away almost from under his nose. If we were quite sure that it was from number 14 and not from number 9 or number 11 that the fish had been stolen, we might conceivably call around to offer to pay for it, but with a cat one is never quite sure. And we cannot call around on all the neighbors and make a general announcement that our cat is a thief. In any case, the next move lies with the wrong's neighbor. As day follows day, and there is no sign of his irate and murder-bent figure advancing up the path, we recover our mental balance and begin to see the cat's exploit in a new light. We do not yet extol it on moral grounds, but undoubtedly the more we think of it, the deeper becomes our admiration. Of the two great heroes of the Greeks, we admire one for his valor and the other for his cunning. The epic of the cat is the epic of Odysseus. The old gentleman with the Dover soul gradually assumes the aspect of a Polyphemus outwitted, outwitted and humiliated to the point of not even being able to throw things at his tormentor. Clever cat! Nobody else's cat could have done such a thing. We should like to celebrate the rape of the Dover soul in Latin verse. As for the Achillean sort of prowess, we do not demand it of a cat, but we are proud of it when it exists. There is a pleasure in seeing strange cats fly at his approach, either in single file over the wall, or in the scattered aimlessness of a bursting bomb. Theoretically, we hate him to fight, but if he does fight and comes home with a torn ear, we have to summon up all the resources of our finer nature in order not to rejoice on noticing that the cat next door looks as though it has been through a railway accident. I am sorry for the cat next door. I hate him so, and it must be horrible to be hated. But he should not sit on my wall and look at me with yellow eyes. If his eyes were any other color, even the blue that is now said to be the mark of the runaway husband, I feel certain I could just manage to endure him. But they are the sort of yellow eyes that you expect to see looking at you from a hole in the paneling in a novel by Mr. Sax Romer. The only reason why I'm not frightened of them is that the cat is so obviously frightened of me. I never did him any injury unless to hate is to injure, but he lowers his head when I appear, as though he expected to be guillotined. He does not run away. He merely crouches like a guilty thing. Perhaps he remembers how often he has stepped delicately over my seed beds, but not so delicately as to leave no mark of ruin among the infant lettuces and the less-than-infant autumn-sprouting broccoli. These things I could forgive him, but it is not easy to forgive him the look in his eyes when he watches a bird at its song. They are ablaze with evil. He becomes a sort of Jack the Ripper at the opera. People tell us that we should not blame cats for this sort of thing, 
that it is in their nature and so forth. They even suggest that a cat is no more cruel in eating a robin than we are cruel ourselves in eating chicken. This seems to me to be quibbling. In the first place, there is an immense difference between a robin and a chicken. In the second place, we are willing to share our chicken with the cat. At least we are willing to share the skin and such of the bones as are not required for soup. Besides, a cat has not the same need of delicacies as a human being. It can eat and even digest anything. It can eat the black skin of a filleted place. It can eat the bits of gristle that people leave on the side of their plates. It can eat boiled cod. It can even eat New Zealand mutton. There is no reason why an animal with so undiscriminating a palate should demand songbirds for its food, when even human beings who are fairly unscrupulous eaters have agreed in some measure to abstain from them. On reflection, however, I doubt if it is his appetite for birds that makes the cat with the yellow eyes feel guilty. If you were able to talk to him in his own language and formulate your accusations against him as a bird eater, he would probably be merely puzzled and look on you as a crank. If you pursued the argument and compelled him to moralize his position, he would, I fancy, explain that the birds were very wicked creatures and that their cruelties to the worms and the insects were more than the flesh and blood could stand. He would work himself up into a generous idealization of himself as the guardian of law and order amid the bloody strife of the cabbage patch, the preserver of the balance of nature. If cats were as clever as we, they would compile an atrocities blue book about worms. Alas, poor thrush, with how bedraggled a reputation you would come through such an exposure, with how honeyish a tread you would be depicted treading the lawn, sparing neither age nor sex, seizing the infant worm as it puts out its head to take its first bewildered peep at the rolling sun. Cats could write sonnets on such a theme. Then there is the other beautiful potential poem, The Cry of the Snail. How tender-hearted cats are. Their sympathy seems to be all but universal, always on the lookout for an object, ready to extend itself anywhere where it is needed, except, as is but human, to their victims. Yellow eyes or not, I begin to be persuaded that the cat next door is a noble fellow. It may well be that his look as I pass is a look not of fear, but of repulsion. He has seen me going out among the worms with a sharp, no, not a very sharp, spade, and regards me as no better than an ogre. If I could only explain to him, but I shall never be able to do so. He could no more appreciate my point of view about worms than I can appreciate his about robins. Luckily, we both eat chicken. This may ultimately help us to understand one another. On the other hand, part of the fascination of cats may be due to the fact that it is so difficult to come to an understanding with them. A man talks to a horse or a dog as to an equal. To a cat, he has to be deferential, as though it had some sphinx-like quality that baffled him. He cannot order a cat about with the certainty of being obeyed. He cannot be sure that, if he speaks to it, it will even raise its eyes. If it is perfectly comfortable, it will not. A cat is obedient only when it is hungry, or when it takes the fancy. It may be a parasite, but it is never a servant. The dog does your bidding, but you do the cat's. At the same time, the contrast between the cat and the dog has often been exaggerated by dog lovers. They tell you stories of dogs that remained with their dead masters, as though there were no fidelity in cats. It was only the other day, however, that the newspapers gave an account of a cat that remained with the body of its murdered mistress in the most faithful tradition of the dogs. I know, again, of cats who will go out for a walk with a human fellow creature, as dogs do, I have frequently seen a lady walking across Hampstead Heath with a cat in train. When you go for a walk with a dog, however, the dog protects you. When you go for a walk with the cat, you feel that you are protecting the cat. It is strange that the cat should have imposed the myth of its helplessness upon us. It is an animal with an almost boundless capacity for self-help. It can jump up walls. It can climb trees. It can run, as the proverb says, like greased lightning. It is armed like an African chief. 
yet it has contrived to make itself a pampered pet so that we are alarmed if it attempts to follow us out of the gate into a world of dogs and only feel happy when it is purring, rolling on its back and purring as we rub its Adam's apple by the fireside. There is nothing that gives a greater sense of comfort than the purring of a cat. It is the most flattering music in nature. One feels, as one listens, like a humble lover in a bad novel who says, You do then like me a little bit, after all? The fact that a cat is not utterly miserable in our presence always comes with the freshness and delight of a surprise. The happiness of a crowing baby, newly introduced to us, may be still more flattering, but a cat will get round people who cannot tolerate babies. It is all the more to be wondered at that a cat, which is such a master of this conversational sort of music, should ever attempt any other. There never was an animal less fit to be a singer. Someone, was it Cowper, has said that there are no really ugly voices in nature, and that he could imagine that there was something to be said even for the donkey's bray. I should have thought that the beautiful voices in nature were few, and that most of them could be defended only on the ground of some pleasant association. Humanity, at least, has been unanimous in its condemnation of the cat as part of nature's chorus. Poems have been written in praise of the corncrake as a singer, but never of the cat. All the associations we have with cats have not accustomed us to that discordant howl. It converts love itself into a torment such as can be found only in the pages of a twentieth-century novel. In it we hear the jungle decadent, the beast of dissolution, but not yet civilized. When it rises at night outside the window, we always explain to visitors, No, that's not Peter. That's the cat next door with the yellow eyes. The man who will not defend the honor of his cat cannot be trusted to defend anything. The End of Cats by Robert Lind This recording read for you by Perry Clayton